All right, so we're at seven o'clock, let's get started. Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Tisdall. Um, today we're trying something that we've always wanted to do for years, and we've just never really had the right setting to try it. We were working for companies that had their own programs or where your medical schools had things they wanted to do. And what I've always believed is one of the great things you can do to practice medicine is just talk about it. And so what we're going to do tonight is we're going to do something that I think you're going to find really challenging and really useful. We are going to do a very strict clinical approach to multiple choice questions. And what it's going to look like is this. Hang on, I'm sharing. Okay, can you all see my screen? Okay, uh, where's my chat? I need chat. When you share, pause, annotate more, chat. All right, everyone see my screen? Okay, good. So take a look at what we're doing here. I want you guys to either screenshot this or get your camera and take a picture of it. <clears throat> Jack has posted it so that you can have a hard copy. This is something I want up in the screen as we do every question. And I'm not kidding, this is the way I always do questions because this is the way you're always going to approach your patient. So when you go into the step one exam, and oh, by the way, your comp exam is two thirds step. So the comp exam is tipped from being old factoidy to really having a clinical feel now. So you gotta get ready for that. So what we're going to do is we're going to walk through this and then we're just gonna stroll our way through some questions. And I'm gonna show you, because we write them, I'm gonna show you how to see the mind of a writer and how to see them through the eyes of a practicing clinician. So this is for you guys. There's only 15 of us. You shouldn't feel any pressure. You shouldn't feel any self-consciousness. Any question you have, I'm sure you, everyone else has it too. And let's see if we can just enjoy a bit of medicine as we learn how to do multiple choice questions. So this is your hour. There's no pressure. It should be kind of fun to do. You should be sitting there with either a beer or a coffee and we should just be talking shop. And you should be thinking about, can I talk to a clinician? Because a good exam question just feels like a conversation. Okay, one of the problems many of you have in taking these exams is you don't read fast. And you're always feeling that pressure. Good, you go get one, Danielle. This is truly supposed to be fun. That doesn't mean it isn't serious. It just means, hey, it's after dinner, we're all hanging out, let's talk shop here. Okay, so let's take a look at where we are. See number one there? Is it a long question? One of the problems probably three quarters of you have is you don't have time to read. You always feel the time pressure in your question blocks. So one of the first things you do to gain speed is take a look, is it a long question? Then just go straight to the bottom of the stem look at the question and look at the answers. And I gotta tell you, that's perfectly fair in clinical medicine. If I was going to go see a patient in a room, I'd stop at the nursing counter and say, hey, who's the lady in 112? And they'd say, oh yeah, bike crash, stopped peeing. Got it. It's just a quick and dirty, where am I gonna start with this? And the same thing with a question. If you just take a look at the peak at the bottom of the question and see what the answer is, oh, I get it. I'm somewhere in heart. And then you only have to read the stem once. If you only have to read the stem once, man, it saves you time and energy and that matters, okay? So everyone happy with that? Quick peek, long question, where am I? Okay, number two, I gotta tell you, I've been doing this for a lot of years. Number two, <laughs> cheers 30, is that your age or are we missing an S there? Okay, number two is the big one. And as we spend more time together, we'll go through why this is true, but most of the people that I get for five days or more, they ski their scores go up 10 to 15% by always doing this. I see someone wrote in once in one of the lectures, what's the fastest, easiest way to do better on comp? And I felt like going, well, I can tell you, age, gender, time frame. Man, if you start every question by seeing your patient, wait till you see how powerful this is. And I can say it to you, and you hear it, but until we practice it with a bunch of questions, you won't internalize it. But that's the big one. 
Okay, if you haven't been introduced to the idea of a chief complaint, well, welcome to the adult world. Put on your big boy pants. This is how medicine works. A chief complaint is something that you can form a differential from, which means you always have an approach. Every time a patient comes in and wants something or has a problem, you're always saying, what is the chief complaint? Because I have a standardized approach to that. Now, in the website, we've developed a whole section of chief complaints and how to do a differential from them. And when students say to me, how do I know I'm ready? I can only tell you I know the answer. When you can do all 50 chief complaints and their differentials and explain it all the way to basic sciences, you're ready for the clinical portion of the exam. After that, a bit of behavioral, some biostats, public health, good to go. From a chief complaint, you form the differential diagnosis. And look how we do this. This isn't naming a bunch of diseases. It's not. You start with which organ systems am I in? From organ system, you go to family of disease. So it might be heart to congestive heart failure. And from congestive heart failure, you go to a specific diagnosis, aortic stenosis. So for you guys, the reason I want you to have this in front of you is every question you do, this is your disciplined approach. Now, look what I'm going to say once you get a diagnosis. Once you get a diagnosis, presentation, pathophys, natural history. Presentation is symptoms, signs, and look what we include with it, testing. Pathophys, you're going to be impressed how often I'm just going to draw you a picture that says, this is how I think about it. And then natural history, this is the hardest one for you guys because you're not treating patients yet. But every time you get a diagnosis, you have to sit with your patient. And the patient's going to say two things to you. Doctor, what does this mean to me? And is there anything we can do about it? So what does this mean to me is your prognosis. And wait till you start putting prognosis into how you think about all your diseases. Because the truth of the matter is, for almost every chronic disease, we stage. And if you haven't thought about this, you just wait till we go through this. You're going to go, oh my God, we stage everything. Of course, because we have to say to the patient, what happens to you? Complications, that sort of speaks for itself. <clears throat> but if you haven't practiced it, you can't believe what you can't do. Okay, so think about this. Here's a good example. Chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, right? Every one of you could tell me something about that. Fair enough? Is that perfectly fair and obvious, right? Number four killer of, of us, maybe somewhere in there, right? Okay, you ready for this? What is the commonest complication of your patient with COPD? <laughs> what is it? Right? You think about all the alpha ones and the elastases and the FEVs and you sweat it over your pulmonary function testing. What's the commonest complication you're looking for? When you have a COPD patient, what's the commonest thing they're going to call you about as a complication? Okay, this is great, Mylon, right? Shortness of breath. Take a look at where we are here. This is, this is what's so much fun about just chatting, right? If I have shortness of breath, is that a symptom? a sign, a test, a pathophys, a prognosis, a complication, or a treatment. <laughs> it's a symptom, right? But what I'm saying to you is, what is the commonest complication? And I'm not beating on you. I'm just saying, you never thought of it this way, did you? But the patient will when they're sitting in front of you. So if you, for example, said COPD, what am I looking for in my patients? I'm going to help you here. Watch this. Acute, chronic. And you know what the commonest acute is going to be? It's going to be acute, bronchitic, exacerbation. No kidding. That's really what it's called. And what happens is no one can really tell you. It's typically like a little bit of pneumonia or superimposed viral infection or just something. They just suddenly get really tight start coughing really, instead of normal mucus, it becomes really green, yellow, pussy mucus. They start getting a fever and they go into respiratory failure. 
This is the commonest complication. And when we say, what are the chronic complications? Okay, you ready for the chronic complications? You've heard of them. You've just never organized it this way. Obviously, cancer. Smokers get cancer. Bronchiolitis obliterans. Not so sure you want me to ask you about that. And then the last one that you're very comfortable with is going to be core pulmonale. So now all of a sudden you just realize, boy, I just haven't been paying attention here, have I? Because I just never really realized how important it is to think through what are you looking for after diagnosis? And then treatment, you notice I didn't say pharmacology, did I? Because treatment might be surgery, it might be drugs, it might be radiation, it might be something else. Stopping smoking is by far and away the best treatment for COPD, okay? So remember, after you've read your stem, don't just go and look at the choices. Don't pick your answer until you stop and say, are they asking me about presentation or pathophys or natural history? Because, you know, I can tell you the commonest way, I see you, Noel, the commonest way I miss a question is by not reading it. I always answer the question I wish they had asked, not the question they do ask. And I, that's my commonest reason for missing them. Okay, Noel, emphysema two for chronic, or do we keep that in acute? Answer it. Someone answer me. When I, when I say COPD, what is emphysema in relationship to COPD? Isn't this fun? I mean, it's just really fun, isn't it? You've seen all these words, you bum around. When I say COPD, COPD, when you think about it, no, this is a great question, Noel. When I say COPD, what do you think of? This is what you should be thinking of. That's how anyone would draw COPD. And what you see in that is emphysema, chronic bronchitis, and asthma. And asthma sort of becomes inseparable because when you smoke, you often get bronchospasm. And so the part that COPD is this. It's defined as COPD, asthma is the devil, it is. And all of this becomes COPD when you decrease the FEV1. So anytime the definition of COPD is FEV1 is less than 80%. And then that can be bronchospastic, it could be chronic cough of mucus, or it can be loss of alveolar septi. Okay, so let's go back to the question. Is emphysema a complication? No, it isn't, is it? What's emphysema? Emphysema is part of the pathophys, isn't it? Well, it's part of the spectrum of it, isn't it, Mia? It's really implicit in the term COPD. That's COPD right there. When I say to you, draw me COPD out clinically, that's what you're going to say, right? So when we say asthma is reversible bronchospasm, chronic bronchitis is mucus production, and emphysema is a decrease in diffusion because you've lost septi. Okay, so when you take a look at this picture here, did that just change how you think about COPD? Isn't that just a really great way of thinking about it? And all of a sudden you say, right, for sure, right? If I say COPD, that's what you should be doing right there, right? Got it. The three circles. Okay, so, okay, so we can play with this forever, right? Think about this. How am I going to differentiate these two? How are you going to differentiate bronchospasm from just the chronic mucus production? Because asthma has mucus production, right? That's IL-13 and all that stuff. How are we going to do it? Okay, so how are you going to say this is a bronchospasm versus this is chronic bronchitis? Okay, Danielle, acute versus chronic is time frame, right? But can bronchospasm go on for a long time? So, yep, I think you're right. If they said it was tight and relaxed, you'd say, okay, that's reversible. That's bronchospasm. 
But supposing they come and they say, I've been tight for a week. What are you going to do to prove that it's bronchospasm? Yeah, you never know what it is, right? It could be virus, dust, allergy, smoke, irritant. Yeah, you're right, but there's no way to do that clinically. There you go, right? That's really nice. Now, is methacholine the easiest test to do? That's a completely correct answer. Nice job. Add a weight, take a bow. Great answer. Yeah, that's the trouble, Noel, right? So what's the better way of doing that? Instead of checking the cholinergics, what are you going to check? Beta agonist. Give a beta agonist. Give a beta agonist. Right. You give them blast about buterol and you see if they blow better. Okay. Now look what Mia said. Mia said read index. Okay. So before we move on, let's just take a look. So what is the read index? When I say read index, what picture am I going to draw? What am I going to draw? Should, you should know exactly what I'm going to draw, right? I'm going to do this and then I'm going to do my cartilage. And then I'm going to draw in my epithelium, right? And into my epithelium, I'm going to draw my glands that make mucus, right? So let's color them in so we know what they are. So here are my mucus glands. Okay, what is the read index, right? You all know this. You're all perfectly good at this, right? So when this is greater than 50%, we call that hyperplasia. Agreed? Everyone happy with that? Everyone get, everyone's already done that on their UWorld questions, right? So everyone perfectly good with that? Okay, but ask yourself this question. What structure is this? <laughs> what is that? What are we looking at there? Yeah, no, I'm in a, me is right. I'm in a friggin' bronchus. <laughs> so how do you get your hands on a bronchus? So, so while it's perfectly good to talk about the read index, you've got to have the whole patient <laughs> and all their lungs to measure it. Good. Okay, so you can appreciate as I'm walking through here, don't you all of a sudden realize how important that it is for you guys to have this really strict organization so that anytime I ask you a question, you know where you're looking for the answer. If you organize your data this way, everything becomes easier. Okay, so all starting to believe that there's powerful stuff going on here that's organizing in a way that's just better than reading words in a book. Any questions? Because we're going to start questions now and, it, and we're going to practice how to do this. Everyone happy? Any questions? Nothing. All right. Here's your first question. Now, remember, I want this sheet in front of you. Age, gender, time frame, find the chief complaint, form a differential. I don't want anything out of that order. Okay, Jack, can we put out our cho answer choices? Let's set out our poll here. And I'm going to make you commit. I know it's unpleasant, but we don't know who you are, and, and that's fine. Commit. Okay, I need, I'll, I'll go forward when I have five votes. Oh, am I blocking the screen? Uh, I can't see my screen, Jack, because this is Zoom. I can't even see my chat box anymore. Ask the students, can you see the chat box? 
Is this blocking anything, students? I'm sorry, Jack, I can't even see my chat box anymore. I'm gonna move it. Maybe let me move it to a different part of my screen. All right. Oh, okay, everyone can move in their own screen. Thanks, Noel. Okay, good stuff. Let's now let's take a look and let's apply that approach to this question, okay? So is this a long question? Um, it's not, but there's nothing wrong with giving it a quick look and asking yourself, where are we going with this? So they're really saying, I'm going to establish a diagnosis. Okay, that's pretty unhelpful, but I can deal with that. So let's start with describe the patient. And boy, I'm just going to beat this into you because it really matters. When I say see the patient, we start with age. And when I say age, I want you to think about it in these broad groups. Over 65, degenerative and malignant. Doesn't have to be, but that's just kind of where you start. Under 25 is going to be hereditary and congenital. And then the other big group is going to be females in the 30s to 40s, and that's our big autoimmune group. And the remaining ages just don't help you one way or the other, okay? So age is over 65, under 25, and then middle-aged females. Next thing we wanna talk about is gender. So when I say male, you think male reproductive and plus one for atherosclerosis. It's just such an overwhelmingly important disease for us. We just always carry it around in our mind. And when I say female, I think female reproductive and minus one for atherosclerosis. And then the last big one that's kind of new for most of you, just because you haven't had it brought up clinically yet, is going to be talking about time frame. Acute versus chronic. So when I say to you, what is the definition of chronicity in an organ? It varies by organ. So let's just go down and make sure you can do the obvious ones. When I say liver, when does a hepatitis B infection become chronic hepatitis B? What is the definition of chronic in liver? Okay, so what did James just describe? Did James describe a time frame or a pathologic condition? Right? So, James, what you described was end stage disease but you can have many, many years before you develop cirrhosis. So the definition of, for example, B becoming chronic is greater than six months. So that's a really good answer. Ah, so everyone's not seeing James' answers, just me. Thanks for that, Danielle, that's great. That's great, yeah, so what James said was cirrhosis. But so what does cirrhosis describe? What cirrhosis described is the model we're gonna talk about another time, which is the model of chronic disease. Because this is what chronic disease looks like, right? Here we are here at normal. And then usually when you're down to about 20 to 30%, that's when you get into failure. Cirrhosis isn't failure. Cirrhosis is right here. Cirrhosis is a measure of severe disease but it's not a measure of acute or chronic. Is that a helpful picture, Noel? So you can see, you can plot cirrhosis takes a long time, so it's part of the spectrum of chronic disease, but it's really a measure of disease severity. Okay? Okay, so liver is greater than six months. What is kidney? 
What's the definition of kidney, chronic kidney failure? Not acute, chronic. Right? So kidney is three months. That's right, Guido. That's a good answer. Okay. When we say joints, how long do you have to have arthritis before we can call you rheumatoid arthritis? Because that's a chronic arthritis. How long do you have to have chronic arthritis before you can entertain rheumatoid? And the answer is six weeks. So if someone comes in with painful joints over five days, you can't call it rheumatoid. It's a chronic arthritis. When we talk about diarrhea, when does diarrhea become chronic diarrhea? And of course that four weeks is a big number because less than that, you're going infection for sure. More than that, yup infections, Plus, we add in all the other diseases you can go for non-infectious causes. And then for this case, heart-lung. What, what do we talk about the definition of chronic in heart-lung? Well, it's not absolute, but the general pretty good rule of thumb would be greater than a week. So I want you to write this down, carry it in a card, put it in your pocket. Every question you ever read starts with age, gender, time frame. And you always start with that and you always see your patient. So let's come back up here and look at our question. Okay, our question says 44, right? Just not terribly helpful. Then we say to ourselves, over three hours. No matter what system you're in, that's going to be acute. And then when we say gender, we've got female, which we're waiting to see whether that's going to help us or not. So the only thing we've got from age gender time frame here is acute. Okay. After we see the patient, we then go looking for our chief complaint. Okay, what's our chief complaint for this lady? What's our chief complaint for this lady? Very nice, everyone. That's really good, right? So that's going to be epigastric pain. So now all of a sudden the question becomes, do you have a way of doing a differential diagnosis of epigastric pain? And this is where you really can be helped working with clinicians because they'll tell you how they do it. And how they do it is certainly going to be how you're tested on it. So let's talk about abdominal pain and how you can approach it in a way that's always going to work. So this is how I think you should do abdominal pain. Right? There's my abdomen. There's my umbilicus. One two, three, four, five would be pelvis if you want to do that, six, and then the hard one here is going to be number seven, which is diffuse abdominal pain. And for every one of those, name the organs and then tell me the commonest disease. I mean, how nice and tight is that? You should hope every question on your exam is abdominal pain. Okay, so number one, that's going to be my right upper quadrant. How many organs there can give me pain? Liver, I like that. And gallbladder, okay, good. Tell me, how does the liver give you pain? How do you get a painful liver? Is the liver innovative for pain? Right? My, my lawn's exactly right. Does the liver, is the liver innovated for pain? That's exactly right, Ogo, right? Nope, the liver has no pain sensation, so it's got to be the capsule. So the only way you can do the capsule is stretch it. Okay? 
So, yep, the liver's got to have a reasonably diffuse enlarging process. So it's got to be the capsular stretch. Okay, how do I get pain in the gallbladder? Stones, not going to live with that. Nope, I'm not going to, nope, I'm not going to accept that. Nope, yes. Right, that's right. Cholecystitis from obstruction. And what do we call that? What is the name of the process where we get cholecystitis from obstruction? That's called, ah, okay, no, that's going to be, and it's not, I'm not tricking you here, that's going to be acute cholecystitis. But watch what I'm going to write here in front of it. Late cholecystitis. So I guess there's a story there, isn't there? Now let's come over here and let's do epigastric. Let's name all the organs and then the commonest disease that can give me pain. Just go from anterior to posterior if you like. Pancreas, okay, we'll start at the back. Perfectly good, I like pancreas, keep going. Stomach, right? Now watch what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna put stomach duodenum because they go together for this problem. Okay, what else? Okay, uh, transverse intestine does not make this because it's almost always a diffuse colonic problem and presents as a diffuse pain. So it doesn't actually localize to the epigastrium, Gwinda. So yeah, I understand why you say that. It's certainly there anatomically, but it doesn't localize. It's a diffuse pain. Okay, well, what about the heart? Can the heart be here? Sure it can. Remember, women get atypical angina. So for sure, you've got to include the heart. Do you know what else you're missing here? You're missing esophagus. Right? Now look what else I'm gonna write here, you guys. Are you ready for this? Early gallbladder. Whoa, whoa. Okay, aortic rupture. See, now all of a sudden, James, you realize the power of organization, don't you? Because when we talk about triple A's, they are diffuse. All of a sudden, that's diffuse, right? Boy, don't you want to plot all your abdominals on this? And then you realize everything just becomes easy. Okay, so here's my epigastric. I want you now, having done the organ, I want you to tell me the disease. So what disease of the pancreas gives me epigastric pain, and what test do we do to diagnose it? What disease of the pancreas gives me epigastric pain and how do I diagnose it? It's not a trick. I just, it's just, you just got to say the right words. Acute pancreatitis, amylase lipase, perfect. Okay. What disease family is stomach duodenum? Ulcers. Yeah, that's all. Oh, not GERD. Mylon, you see, you got your anatomy slipping here, but not ulcers. You know what I'm going to say, Noel? Watch what I'm going to write. Is that better? Right? So now I say peptic ulcer disease, and now I know I'm talking about stomach and duodenum together. Okay, how do we diagnose ulcers, Noel? Yeah, it's just right. All of a sudden, when you get the right words, everything's always going to be used that way, right? Okay, so how do we diagnose ulcers? Yeah, you look, right? It's direct visualization biopsy. Okay, what, is, what in my heart is going to give me pain there? What disease process? Yeah, that's right. And followed by biopsy, but first you look to find it. Sure, so that's going to be my acute myocardial infarction, anything related to ischemia. Okay, now you can say GERD. Esophagus is going to be GERD. 
Okay, you guys, how do I diagnose GERD? How do I diagnose GERD? Yeah, that's right. Yep, you're going to visualize and biopsy and see the inflammation. Okay, so what the heck is going on here? So now all of a sudden we've got to do the pathophysiology of gallbladder inflammation, okay? So let's do it. Here's my gallbladder. And when I say, what is the starting pathophysiologic process of acute cholecystitis? When I say acute cholecystitis, what starts the whole friggin' thing off? I want one word. <laughs> no, it doesn't correlate with serum cholesterol. That's right, Danielle. We always start here. It starts with obstruction. When you say acute cholecystitis, the next word out of your mouth is obstruction. Now, what's the commonest cause of obstruction? Right? 90% is a stone. Okay, but supposing I find a stone right there. If I've got my abdominal pain and I do an ultrasound and I see that stone, have I proved acute cholecystitis? Yeah, all I've proved is cholelithiasis, as Mylon points out. And if you take all Americans, 8% of males, 16% of females. So finding a stone doesn't mean a thing. The stone has to be wedged in the neck of the gallbladder and cause obstruction. Everyone happy with that idea? So it's not just a question of finding the stone. It certainly can. You notice I only said 90%, James? So the other 10% is all kinds of other causes, right? But remember how medicine works. Medicine is practical statistics. Anything that's 90%, that's all. Anything that's less than 10%, that's none. Until the patient doesn't work right, and then you go back looking for rare things. So when you make your list, don't try to make it everything. It's always 80-20. And any statistic that isn't 90-10, I don't learn because it doesn't matter. It's not actionable. Okay? So you notice the first thing that happens is obstruction. But are we still making the mucus here? Is this mucus still being made in the gallbladder and swelling it? Doggone rights it is. So after obstruction, we get distension. So number two is distension. Now, when I talk about gut, tell me about the innervation of the gut. Tell me about the innervation of the gut. Yikes. <laughs> wow, I wasn't looking for that coming tonight. <laughs> Remember, this is our these are our unmyelinated nerve fibers, right? And what do they detect? Yes, it is vagus. Quite right, it's vagus, right? And what does it respond to? What are the only pain fibers? They only respond to two things. What are the two things that you're innovated for in all of your gut? Duodenum, jejunum, colon, the works. There's only two things that they will respond. Yes, Danielle, right? So the first thing is going to be stretch. And what's the other thing? Inflammation. Inflammation. Okay, so now all of a sudden we realize that this distension is on my unmyelinated nerve fibers, which are going up to the vagus nerve 10. So is that localizing? When you go up the vagus through the autonomic nervous system, is that localizing? 
No, it's not, right? This is called visceral pain. And so it is referred. And it kind of refers to embryologically where that organ start from. That's where the body sort of back places what it is. So when you talk about now where the body sees this pain, it sees it at about T4. So there's my pain right there. So distension is going to give me colicky epigastric pain because it's referred visceral pain. Everyone with me? It's not diffuse, is it, James? It's epigastric. Okay, so now what happens to our pathology is now we start to get compromise and breakdown of the blood vessel supply, and we start to get bacteria and inflammation going out. And now all of a sudden what we see is here on the fundus where I have my peritoneum, Now I see inflammation of my peritoneum. Is my peritoneum innervated how? What is the innervation of my peritoneum? You ready for this? This is myelinated and somatic meaning it comes off all those nerves in our spine that localize. So now all of a sudden, where does we see the pain? This now becomes somatic pain. And so now when we look at this pain, where are we going to find it? It's going to go from colicky epigastric. Yeah, it's going to become steady right upper quadrant. Can you see that? And you can see that this is going to take hours, right? This transition is going to take four to six hours for the inflammation to break down and get to the peritoneum. Everyone see this pathologic process? Oh, Danielle, it's exactly the same. First, we get obstruction, which is visceral referred pain, and then we get breakdown to the peritoneum, and now we have localizing pain. Really keen observation, Danielle. Nice job. Okay, so let's take a look at this. Tell me now about the physical exam. So if we're comparing these two, tell me about the physical exam of early versus late. What's my physical exam going to show in early disease? Nothing. Nothing. It's a negative exam because all you've got is this, which is stretch. There's nothing for you to evoke there. But when we come down and say, what are we going to see in late? This is when we're going to see a Murphy sign. Right? Because when your big fat fingers go walking across that peritoneum, they take the big breath. Let me get up a bit. They take the breath and you run the fundus of that inflamed peritoneum over your fingers. Oh, ah, ooh, ah that really hurt. Right? So take a look at that pathophysiology. And now what did the exam question ask? What's not going to be terribly helpful in early disease? Okay, so all of a sudden, what seemed to be kind of a straightforward question is actually a really pretty serious question, isn't it? Because it's asking you, first of all, to make your differential diagnosis. And then it's asking you about the difference here between the pathophysiology of early and the pathophysiology of late. Isn't that a doozy? And once you hear the story, it's a perfectly straightforward story. But if you don't know it, boy, that's a hard thing to figure out. 
So let's come back now with all that information and let's see if the story makes sense. Okay, you guys read it yourselves and see if you can understand the clinician that wrote this story, probably about a patient he saw last week. Read, read it to yourselves now. Okay, so now let's take a look at our, at our story because now all of a sudden we realize with epigastric pain, right? Now all of a sudden our differential diagnosis, you can form one now, can't you? So now all of a sudden we're saying early gallbladder, peptic ulcer disease, pancreatitis, GERD, and just to be on the safe side, acute myocardial infarction. That's our differential, isn't it? So let's take a look now and take a look at our choices. Is electrocardiogram going to be a useful test? Oh, well then if you were, Gwenda, this is brilliant because now you've got your brain thinking like the exam writer, which is always <laughs> where you want to be. And it's always this progression. Okay. So do we need an EKG for this lady? Justin, could she have an acute myocardial infarction? Could she have an acute myocardial infarction? Ah, right. So yeah, that's in our differential because women have a typical angina. Okay, do we need imaging? Okay, I see your question. We'll come back to ascending cholangitis, okay? Oh yeah, for sure, right? We'll talk about imaging, but we haven't talked about how you make the diagnosis of acute cholecystitis, but you know we're talking echo or ultrasound. Okay, do we need lab testing? Which in this differential do we need lab testing? Can you see where we need lab testing? Because I can see two. Right, exactly right. I need it for my pancreatitis and I need my cardiac troponins for MI. So I really need lab testing here. Do I need endoscopy? Do I need endoscopy? Yeah, for sure, right? I need it for peptic ulcer, but I need it for one more. Yeah, I need it for my GERD. So I can use EKG for my MI. I need imaging for my ultrasound gallbladder. I need lab testing for my amylase and my troponins, and I'm gonna need endoscopy for my GERD and peptic ulcer disease. But look where we are, colicky epigastric. Are we early or late cholecystitis? It, oh, really? Really? Is it really late, Justin? Or is late when it's full thickness, right? Late is full thickness, exactly. So is the physical exam, name any one of these guys where the physical exam is helpful. Is the physical exam helpful for any of those? Right? Isn't that crazy? Everyone tells you, oh, history and physical. Yeah, does the physical exam remotely help you here? It's just not helpful. And can't you see from looking at this question, age, gender, time frame, find the chief complaint, do a differential diagnosis. Okay, now when we come back and we look at this history, if we can confirm acute cholecystitis, what in this history helps us think that it's acute cholecystitis? Can you see, I can only see one set of facts in here that help me make it more likely. Can you see what they are? right? Yeah. I mean, we don't have a BMI. So if I, I, I wouldn't give it to you because it's, it would be too leading in the conversation, but you notice I, it says she's brought by her children. No one's going to say she's fertile. What they'll say is she's had this many children or her children bring her to the ER and then you, you're looking for it. So, you know, 
So she's female, she's in her 40s, and she's had children. That's a pretty good start, isn't it? Okay, we're going to finish up this question by coming down, and I want one more principle for you guys to learn from this question. So do you both have a good idea of the differential? And do you all have now a, the image that we want for pathophys? When I say, what is the pathophys of acute cholecystitis? Can you see it? Obstruction, distension, inflammation, breakdown of the wall. She might still well be fertile. Okay. Can you see that when I say, what's the pathophys? You see how you form an image of it? And then you don't have to remember it. You just see it. Everyone good on that? Because I need you to see it for the next question. Okay. So here's my next question that you've got to understand. Testing teaches pathophys. In other words, the reason a test works is because it illustrates an essential part of the pathology. That's why it's a good test. So what do we want to do? What are the key elements that we can test for with this image? What, what test will let us see that image? And, and that's going to be how we diagnose this disease ending. Okay, that's great, Justin. Tell me how ultrasound shows what parts of these pathology. Because you just need to look at the picture and you can tell me. Yes, thank you, Mylon. We'll come back to that. That's exactly right. What's number one? Number one first. What's number one? Right, you can see the stone, right? For sure, that's a really good thing. And then you're gonna see it dilate, and then you're gonna see a thick wall, okay? So when we finish this conversation, and we talk now about the diagnosis and the ultrasound, the definition of ultrasound diagnosis is gonna be one, obstructing stone, and now here comes the tricky part thick wall why is the wall thick okay i like that very much justin go ahead okay james we're gonna have to talk to you keep that thought james make sure i answer your question but justin's gonna lead us to the, the promised land tell me about thickening and inflammation Yeah, okay, so what? Yeah, yeah, no, <laughs> none of that's right. <laughs> oh, I'll make you care for sure. Okay, that's why I'm asking this, right? What are the hallmarks of acute inflammation? What are the hallmarks of acute inflammation? Rumor, tumor, calor, dolor. Rumor, tumor, calor, dolor, functio lessa. Okay. Can you tell me why? Why is, why is it red? Why is it warm? Why is it painful? Why is it swollen? Okay, good. This is really good. Now, have you guys done your acute inflammation in immunology? Oh, have you? That's so sad because now you're responsible for it. Okay, so watch what I'm going to do. I'm going to show you how I want you to think about acute inflammation, right? And then we're going to come back and talk about ultrasound because you got to have this picture of acute inflammation or I can't talk to you because they're just words. Words are terrible things. You've got to have images. Okay. So let's just do skin. It's an easy thing to draw. So here are all my bacteria. How does the body know they're there? Oh, dear Lord, Dr. Rubish is watching. She and I have done this together, no kidding, for five years. And she always watches with horror 
<laughs> when I asked this question and you got, Mary, Nicole. There you go, Mary. Nice job. Okay, so we've got a pamp and we've got probably some tissue damage, so we probably got a damp. Excellent. Okay, and what do they signal to? Nice job. What do they signal to? Not neutrophils. Absolutely not. Okay, good. So toll-like receptors are called pattern recognition receptors, but what cells are they on? There's two cells that sit in all the tissue waiting. Nice. So that's my macrophage. Nice. I'm going to do that little symbol. What's my second cell? Yeah, it could be. But that's kind of, I can put APC here. That could be the same cell. We kind of lump them together. They're not quite, but uh, this is great. You know what it is? You ready? It's the basophil. And you're going to see why we need Mr. Basophil, but I'm going to put all those big blue granules so that you see them. Okay? Natural killer, possibly, but that's kind of more viral and it's kind of between acute and chronic inflammation. The two cells are your macrophages and your basophils. Okay, when they get stimulated, what is my macrophage going to produce? I'll give you a big fat hint. What is my macrophage going to produce? Nice. I-L. Wait, does that say 12? Eh, no. I-L-1. Yep. <laughs> TNF, nice. Okay, you ready? You got these are the big three, man. These are always the big three. Oh, that's so good. IL6. Okay, what's my basophil gonna produce? What's my basophil gonna produce? Hmm. Yes, very good. Nice, good answer. And it actually produces hundreds of products, no kidding, hundreds. But the two you're gonna key on are gonna be histamine and bradykinin. Okay, got it? And now all of these signaling are going to signal down to my blood vessels. So here's my nice little post-capillary venule and these are all going to cause vasodilation. So all of a sudden now, we're going to get this. And you notice I've done two things here. I've vasodilated, right? And I've created gaps. I need both of those for this problem. And the reason I vasodilate is because the whole point of this is to capture a neutrophil. And neutrophils flow in two pools. They flow in a marginal pool and they flow in a circulating pool. And when I slow it down, as James has pointed out, I'm going to slow everybody down and everybody's going to be slow and marginal. And that's going to allow me to do my first capture, which is going to be selectins to. Addressins. And that's going to be my slow rolling. And that then is going to allow my next step, which is going to make my neutrophil stick hard, which is going to be ICAMs to my integrins. And that then, with this stuck right here, that's going to allow the gradient. So I'm going to get diapedesis and I'm going to have my gradient. Okay, so what are the attracting signals that make up my gradient? What are the things up here that say to the neutrophil, this is the right direction to go? Very good, James. Good. This is really good. That's a really nice list. So IL8 and all the others. Okay, two quick points to take out of this. Because I have all these gaps, I get all my protein leaking out. Why do I need that? Why do I need all of that protein pouring out as an exudate? 
because it's going to make two really important parts of my inflammatory response. What are the two things? Because what I'm going to see is going to be high molecular weight proteins. So what are the proteins that are sort of really central to acute inflammation? Anyone? No. Okay, you ready? The first thing is going to be, I've got to increase the signal of my bacteria. How do I make the signal for phagocytosis much, much brighter? I have proteins. Nope. IgG. Good, Danielle, right? It's going to be IgG. And one more thing, please. C3. Yes, there's the right answer. C3B. These are my opsonins. And they're going to increase the signal a thousand fold. Wow. And the only way I can get those big proteins is to open gaps in the endothelial cells so those big proteins can come pouring out. And the second big protein I need is fibrinogen because that's going to form a giant fibrin mesh and goo everybody all up. Which virulence factor in staph breaks that down? It's how you tell a pathogenic from a non-pathogenic staph is that virulence factor. What virulence factor is that? Coagulase. Yeah. Coagulase actually is going to break down that fibrinogen. Okay. So everyone can walk me through that story, right? So let's now take a look and we'll finish up on this note. Ruber, why is inflamed tissue red? Why is inflamed tissue red? Vasodilation. Why is it warm? Vasodilation. Vasodilation again. It's not inflammation. No, no. Yeah, it's vasodilation, right? They're not trying to lose heat. They are vasodilated by the bradykinin and histamine. It's actually a conscious part, okay? What is the pain from? Why is it painful? Yeah, bradykinin increases the sensitivity of my nerve fibers a thousand fold. And finally, after all that discussion, we come to what we really want to talk about in our gallbladder. So why tumor? And man, we use that tumor for most of our inflammatory processes. You're going to look for, so when we come back up here and we say to ourselves, tell me about what we're looking for in our diagnosis, right? And I say thick wall, which of the hallmarks do I use for my thick wall? We key on the exudate. When you diagnose acute pericarditis, isn't that great, James? How do you diagnose acute pericarditis? Ultrasound showing thickening of the pericardium with a water signal. How do we diagnose appendicitis? Thickening of the appendiceal wall, that's from the exudate right? It's always from, the, we, the exudate is very specific. Okay, this is how wild it gets. If I was going to do P, whoops, would that still count though? Would what still count? I can't, I, that sounds like a great question. Yeah, yeah, that, I mean, it's the thickening of the whole wall and the peritoneum. No, it's the thickening of the whole gallbladder wall, but the edema will lift up the peritoneum for sure. Okay, this is how critical the exudate is. If you do PPD testing for tuberculosis, right, where you do the little epidermal and you measure the response, which is more specific, 
the redness or the hardness? When you do TBT testing, what do you look for in it? Yeah. What do you, th- no, not the heart, not the redness, the hardness. What's the hardness from? Why is it hard? Yeah, it's exudate. It's exudate. No, it's exudate. Exudate is a really specific finding of inflammation. And all of a sudden you realize opening those gaps up really kind of matters, doesn't it? Isn't that crazy? So if you haven't thought about ruber, tumor, cal, or dolor, and the exudate is kind of what we always look for in medicine, wow, it just suddenly feels like a different thing, doesn't it? Okay, I'm going to close with one last pimp. Okay, here's my last pimp for you. Okay, here's my Integrin eye cam right here. What is the model disease we use for that? What's the model disease of people who lose the Integrin eye cam link? Yeah, that's right. Leukocyte adhesion deficiency, right? Because they lose their CD1118 and they lose the, that's an integrin that they can't bind with. Okay, so take a look at that. That takes, a, it takes about an hour to do a good question. <laughs> it does, it really does. I've done this lots of times. You, you never get past the first question. Okay, so now take a look at that question. Doesn't a lot of medical thinking go into that? Isn't that just really fun to do? Yeah, isn't that great? And don't you feel so totally different about acute inflammation and gallbladders and distensions versus thickenings and, and you know, now differentials of acute abdominal? Don't you want to go do all the rest of the differential of abdominal pain now? Don't you know you need that? You know you need that. Okay. Um, I think this is a great, no, we, and it's really fun to do, isn't it? Isn't this really lighthearted? You can drink a beer or your coffee or a soda, your feet are up. You don't care if you're right or wrong. It's just kind of really good, right? Medicine really is fun. And we, and you know, so Jack and I talk a lot about how do we do this two or three times a week, right? You should just going to go Friday, you know, I'm going to meet you guys at 830. I just want to hang out for an hour and talk medicine. Doesn't it just feel like that? It's just kind of fun, isn't it? Okay, well, thanks for coming. Um, This is what we need from you guys, right? We sort of need you guys to tell us if this was good or not, right? Because if this is good, I really like doing this. It's really fun to do. You're really, you know, you guys volunteer, so it's really good to do. Can you imagine what happens when these start to repeat, right? I mean, imagine when these all really repeat. So tell Jack how you liked it. Tell him what we could do better. Tell him how often it would be good. Uh, I really like doing it. So for me to kind of show up at seven o'clock and do a question is really kind of fun for me with students that want to be here. (laughs) So let's tee that up. I'm really happy to do it. Um, The other thought we had was one of the things I thought would be fun is we could do open forum. So you guys could come with a question and we'll just go wherever the question takes us. The other thing that's really fun for me to do is to start with a fact. Hey, let's do your analysis and just sort of see where we go with it. So, you know, Jack and I kick this around. I think multiple choice night is a really good night, right? Yeah, questions are really good, aren't they, Danielle? And I'm not kidding when I say see the patient, find the chief complaint, do a differential, presentation pathophys, natural history. That never goes away, right? Oh, yeah, isn't that the truth? Yeah, that's right, Danielle. But open mic is kind of fun, and student questions are kind of fun too. So let us know if you want me to do like a multiple choice question. We'll just take an hour like this. It gets faster as you know more. Um, Let us know, because I like doing it, and Jack sort of said, well, what the heck? You know, medical students don't have lives, so Friday night will be fine. Let us know what you like. If this is good, we'll do it again. 